Live from New Orleans, it's theCUBE. Covering Veeam on 2017. Brought to you by Veeam. We're back at Veeam on 2017 in New Orleans. Andrew Christensen is here, he's a senior systems engineer with the Global Data Center Study Group. Uh, higher Ed Organization, Andrew, welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. So, you're welcome, so interesting name, tell us about the organization. Study Group, Study Group uh, began life as a, a small education college in the UK uh, about 15 years ago. Um, over the time, uh, we've grown to a global organization. We take on about 85,000 students a year um, from close on 160 countries. Uh, we have 85 sites around the world, um, very much a global footprint, both in uh, corporate terms and in IT terms. Okay, is this your first VMON? No, it's not. Uh, I came to uh, the previous one in Las Vegas, and that experience meant that I had to come back to this one at New Orleans. Really, why? W tell us about that. Oh, it's a great experience. Um, they know how to do their events very well. The information is first class. And as a Veeam product user, the information and the uh, experience in the room available to you is wonderful. H how long have you been a Veeam customer? How did you, what, tell us Ooh. about your journey. Well, our journey. Um, we were very much in the legacy ballpark of backups. We had some uh, unnamed products that we were using, um, which were very old school in their thinking and how they did things. Um, we realized quickly that the amount of data that we took on was growing um, and was going to outpace our capacity for backup and the simplicity and complexity was growing too fast for us. Couldn't manage it, it wasn't going to be feasible. Went to market to start looking for a better solution and Veeam was uh, top of the list. So you mentioned data growth mm. as one of the catalysts for which created more problems, obviously, for your backup. Made it harder to meet, maybe it was backup windows at the time, or RPO and RTO. Did your decision to change your backup also coincide with, a, th with an increase in virtualization, and did that have a ripple effect? Can, can, you, can, can you explain? We've been talking about that all week, but I'd like to validate it with the practitioner. No, spot on there. Um, we virtualized quite early on in the grand scheme of things. Um, we went to uh, VMware very quickly. We're now running uh, a hypervisor with a, a vSphere 5.5 environment. Now that was all well and good. I don't think the practices that we took in and a lot of the infrastructure alongside that kept up with that. Um, backups is one of those things. And when we started looking at what we needed um, to really work with our environment, get the most out of our uh, sort of virtualization project, um, we needed to do something very quickly, and backups was a key feature. Andrew, as, as a global organization, mm. how does cloud fit into you know, your architecture, what you're doing? Maybe you can uh, kind of sketch out a little bit for you know, you know, where cloud fits. Um, our solution, although quite simple in principle, um, it's never simple, let's face it. Anything in IT, especially on the en engineering <laughs> scope, uh, never simple. This keeps getting more complicated. Exactly it? right. Yeah. And you know, for better or worse, that's how we do these things, especially when it comes to a, a cloud scenario. You add a little bit of complexity, but often it, uh, it pans out to be worthwhile, especially in dollar value. Um, our solution takes local backups um, in a hub and spoke concept, so our data centers being the hub and our branch sites being the spoke. Consolidate the data from all sites, um, hold a decent amount of uh, data as backup on site, and then everything else will actually ship out to the cloud, and that uh, being AWS in Glacier Storage. Um, now that came about mostly because our core data center is in Las Vegas, but we have no hands on site. Um, so we didn't really have the option of a manual tape service, um, a paid for service, very expensive. Um, so we needed to shift away from the, uh, your old school typical tape service environment. Um, having good bandwidth in Las Vegas um, and availability uh, to get to the AWS regions made it a good solution for us. A tool to do that, already in place with Veeam, made it very simple. Right. So, wait, so your target, sorry Stu, your target is Glacier? Correct, yes. So long term retention and legal retention um, especially, uh, we push everything out to Glacier to fill that need for us. And, and okay, so that's the last, but there's the thing, uh, maybe I missed it, there's something in between, obviously, if you need to do a Correct. recovery, right? Yeah. Correct, so we keep some local storage as well. Um, depending on the environment and the data itself, we'll keep it locally, uh, on site, in our racks, uh, for a certain amount of time. Maybe a year, maybe two years, depending on some of the data. Um, everything else, as a, a duplicate and uh, long term, goes out to AWS. 
Right. There were a couple of announcements this week about AWS mm. and also about Glacier. Uh, what did you hear? What, what interests you? Well, I mean, the V10 announcement and its interaction with AWS, um, hooking in your AWS accounts for S3, Glacier and whatnot, very promising, very promising, very excited. I'm going to hit up my account manager for a, a, a trial on that very soon because that um, could simplify our process and I imagine a lot of other people with hybrid cloud scenarios will leverage it as well. Um, for those people that have uh, workloads in AWS, um, the agentless backup function, very promising. I mean, it's a logical step, I think, and the partnership that's built that is very logical as well. It's going to help a lot of people. What is driving in your industry the, the availability needs, and how has that evolved over the last couple of years? Well, it, it's a catch-22. Um, for us, uh, data security is paramount. Um, a student comes to us, they sign up for a course, um, in a lot of cases, they'll be an international student. Now that's all well and good, but um, when we look at the data that we take from that student to get them into a course, it's essentially a, a how-to kit for data theft and identity theft. So we need to protect that data very well. You know, we've got uh, a lot of personal information, we've got passport photos, we've got visa applications, the whole shebang. Um, so being able to make sure that, A, it's available for the people that need it, so that they can get them into their courses, get them learning stuff, which is what our, our ideal is, and making sure it's secure, no matter where we put it, uh, backups, um, availability, all that sort of stuff, needs to be secure. So a solution and a tool has to incorporate that as easily as possible. Bill Philbin was asking the audience this morning, uh, have you ever had to do a recovery? Mm. Um, he said about a third of the audience's hands went up. Presuming your, your, your hand was up. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh. yes, yes we have. I mean, We've both tested, and we've actually had incidents where uh, we've had malware come into the business in certain aspects, and having a good uh, recovery point on site and a quick, easy interface. The single pane of glass, uh, to coin a, a pro word at the moment, was very useful. Um, you know, it stops the heart a little bit when it does happen, but um, after you go through the hoops and you understand what you're doing with the product, um, it, it really does give you a sense of security. You know, large organizations, you know, big banks in the, in the money business, for example, they have you know, very explicit, you know, disaster recovery plans. They might have three site data centers. They get gobs of money they can throw at this stuff. Higher education tends to be, you know, a, a little tighter with, with the budget, mm. fair to say. But also a lot of smaller and mid-sized organizations, I think it's fair to put you in that category, oftentimes had very little, if any, sometimes data, data disaster recovery. Mm. Um, and what they've done is when they re-architected their backup, they said, you know, we can kill two birds with one stone and sort of bring those two worlds together. Is that what you did and how would you describe it? Uh, I, I'd call our solution a bit of a hybrid. Um, yep. In line with a backup scenario that we do have, both off-site and a hybrid cloud scenario, we also do a DR solution in, internally. So we have a data center in Las Vegas. We also have one in Sydney. Um, and so we do take some DR concepts down to Sydney to hold on to that. Very limited. Um, you bang for buck with DR, it's very hard to justify when you go to the managers and say, look, you know, the cost of failure needs to be calculated here. It's very difficult to make that argument successfully. Yeah. So having a tool that we already used that could also do that, very helpful in the first place. Um, you're right in that we are an SMB in the traditional sense, um, and the feature set that does come with Veeam is quite good for that, I think. Um, we're quite OPEX shy as a tradition. Um, so being able to put a little bit of infrastructure in place and sort of pre-purchase these things, get the cost out of the way with CapEx, helped us a lot. So no more licensing involved, Veeam took care of it in-house already, and uh, a little bit of expenditure took that solution very well for us. Yeah. Andrew, one of the interesting discussions we've seen in the last few years when we talk in the education realm is the, the, the importance of data mm. and how can you leverage that data. Of course, you, you talked about some of the security aspects. Uh, how, how has the role of data changed in, in, in your world? It's a bit of a catch-22. Um, it's recognized that we do take on a lot of data. Um, how we use that, it's, it's an ongoing question. I mean, people have put a lot of uh, a BA type roles in place to try and leverage that a bit further, get some use out of it. We have this data, it should be an asset to us. It's very difficult to do successfully, I think. People don't really know the questions to ask of their data. Um, you know, maybe there's a bit of thought leadership or some extra disruptive technology that should come along and help that out a little bit. Um, I think in the near future, it will be a, a very big question that needs to be answered and a lot of, uh, of demands can be met by that.
Okay, H how about your students? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they, there's, there's gotta be from all the devices, you know, what, what, what kind of pressures does that put on the IT role? Well, it's substantial. I mean, in our particular role, um, especially in the UK and Europe, we actually house our students. Um, so everything from uh, living aspects to education and whatnot, um, everything is uh, handled by us. So their safekeeping, all their lifestyle, their uh, quality of life and such. Um, now, in today's modern age, you, you know, have two iPads, you have a Chromebook, you have a, an iPhone and whatnot. All that needs to be handled by us in a secure fashion. Um, the data that comes from that, the content that gets delivered to the students, both privately and during their education, um, it, it needs to be both readily available and useful. Um, uh, making it available to the students, as well as protecting them, I suppose, um, in a secure fashion, making sure that uh, the data that they hand out over these networks and uh, use is safe, um, that's a big concern to us. So a lot of talk this week about ransomware, of course, mm. um, kind of in your position, talk about getting a little, make the heart stop a little bit. How do you look at that problem? What solutions do you, do you have? And what would you like to see the industry do? Uh, it, it's, it's a difficult question. There's no easy answer to that at all. Um, recently we've heard a lot about machine learning and predictive analytics and whatnot. Um, we use some products that do uh, real-time assessment of um, file stores, file usage and whatnot and predict uh, excess usage, I suppose. Um, all of a sudden you can start seeing if there are extra files being encrypted very quickly. Um, you can take action based on that because it is a, a clear sign of ransomware. That said, um, we, we educate a lot of young people. Um, we educate a lot of young people in IT as well. Um, we have identified that a key threat is often going to be from internal. Um, how we protect against that has really shifted our mindset a fair bit. Um, a, lot, a lot more legislation's coming in, in the UK especially, um, starting to come in the US and Australasia, and the requirement for that is only going to grow. It's a challenge that I can't really say in the future, how we're going to predict it and act on it, but it is always going to be in front of mind. Do you think you could use your backup data, uh, because essentially you're pushing change data over the network, mm. you know, constantly or at least multiple times per day, I presume, yes. right? Do you have the tooling to monitor mm. that activity and identify anomalous behavior where maybe you're pushing more data or you're seeing more encrypted data going mm. at a particular time? Does the tool do the tools exist to do that today? To an extent, yes. Um, getting them all together to be viewable and usable data for your uh, technician, your engineers and whatnot is a bit of a challenge, I think. Um, antivirus and security software is out there that can do this for you. Um, also, the data analytics tools that are out there at the moment, um, uh, Veeam 1 is actually a useful tool on that front, can help us out a lot there. Making sure that the person responsible or looking for that uh, trend knows where to go and has a good uh, a single pane of glass, per se, to actually identify issues, I think that's the key. Could you, another, I've been thinking about sort of how to solve this problem, <laughs> could, could you put like phantom files out there in the network? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, phantom high value files, like student credit card list. <laughs> and, I mean, the honey, and, honeypot scenario? Yeah, really? use it as a honeypot, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of the more enterprise uh, size corporations are doing this, and you can actually leverage that, um, take them on as a service if you, you need to. There are companies out there that will offer this service to you. Um, it is quite expensive, what it is, and yet when we calculate the cost of failure, I think the expense might be justified. Well, like you said, it's mm -hmm. hard. To, you know, you're CapEx, I, I, CapEx phobic, I forget what you said, but I'll say mm -hmm. CapEx phobic, but uh, challenged. Um, okay, l we're out of time, but sort of last mm -hmm. question. Um, takeaways from Veeam on 2017, things that you're excited about? Once again, the AWS announcements in V10 and the partnerships coming from that, very exciting, very exciting. Um, looking forward to that and being able to test it a little bit. Um, the feature set that keeps growing. I mean, we started out in 8.5, uh, Veeam 8.5, went out into 9.5, and the growth from 8.5 to 9.95 and now 10 on the horizon is massive. If they continue this growth, it's going to be one of the best products out there. I'm very happy about that. Great. All right, Andrew, thanks very much. Appreciate Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest right after this short break. This is theCUBE. We're live from Veeam on in New Orleans.